Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, Nakia Gopalwala, am student I, of MSc Medical Technology. And I, Atulia Vijayan, student of BSc Medical Technology from Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences, will take you forward to our next session on Technology Towards Advancement of Allied Healthcare Professionals. Over the past few years, technology has become a major factor of competition in the entire healthcare industry. The quality of facilities plays an important role in shaping the healthcare programs. Existing and future technologies in healthcare will greatly influence the way healthcare is practiced and delivered. Advanced technology would help in improving health-related aspects such as early and precise diagnosis, patient monitoring and safety, as well as reduction of medical errors. May I now invite Mr. Arun Krishnan, Senior Project Manager, Biomedical Engineering and Technology Innovation Center, IIT Bombay, and Dr. Ambuj Chaturvedi, Senior Vice President, ICICI Knowledge Park, Hyderabad, onto the dais. Our first speaker, Mr. Arun Krishnan, is the Senior Project Manager at Biomedical Engineering and Technology Innovation Center also known as BETIC. IIT Bombay, sir, is involved in implementing medical device innovation programs to strengthen, sustain, and scale up innovative project activities. He acts as a liaison between various stakeholders to foster translational research, product innovation, entrepreneurship, and mentoring interdisciplinary teams for medical technology projects. We now request sir to please address the audience. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, uh, thank you Symbiosis uh, for conducting this conference and inviting me to be part of it. Today uh, on focus area would be technology and innovation empowering allied health professionals. In this session I'm not going to talk about any technology, futurist technology which is there. I think multiple people have covered already uh, these topics. So I want to uh, stay to what is from virtual reality what is the reality in our country and what could be done uh, to make sure our transformation of healthcare can happen in our country so globally what is happening is there is technology infusion uh, in healthcare happening uh, starting from um, 1.0 2.0 we are somewhere between 3.0 to 4.0 where we started with patient encounter simple diagnosis and treatment and moving towards uh, medical equipment digital imaging visual tracking um, CT, uh, MRA machines which are there. Then from there we move to electronic records, uh, telehealth and um, we are looking at smart health, connected care, personalized medicine, AI and somewhere we would also reach to virtual care. Uh, being say you have a military surgeon and very valuable resource and you don't want them to go to uh, the field and actually operate the uh, uh, directly, it's a risky task. So we, we might get into that uh, stage where the surgeon can even stay at their hospital and uh, take care of the trauma which is happening to the soldiers or uh, you know, who are fighting for us. So all of that, uh, if you look the technology transformation, it's all focused on patient-centric healthcare services. Now, patient-centric healthcare services need, need people, infrastructure, technology, all in place to make sure that patient is. Uh, the, uh, the right kind of treatment is given to the patient. If you look, up, look at our country's current healthcare professionals, just people which uh, we are uh, falling shortage of healthcare professionals, they are distributed uneven geographically. Um, very few infrastructure for training and also uh, for allied health professionals as well as health professionals. Um, you can see the revolution related healthcare forces are shortage by 18 lakhs. If you look at uh, dental assistant technology related people, the shortage by 20 lakhs. Although more the reason that technology is needed, uh, there is no running away from the technology. Uh, we have to adapt it. All the healthcare professionals has to adapt and uh, make sure that we would be able to deliver the right kind of service to the patients. Coming from the healthcare, what is happening in the medical device industry? We have been bombarded with um, high cost, good quality products from the Western countries and low cost. Um, uh, less lesser quality product from the eastern countries. We have regulations in place. The situation is not dark. There is uh, a ray of hope. Uh, there are very uh, very suitable or very significant local needs which are there in our country, which needs to be addressed. 
And there's a lot of technology push which is happening uh, in multiple areas of 3D printing, AI, machine learning, augmented reality. We are good with technology. So uh, bringing both these two together is, is where uh, the Indian medical device industry can uh, grow. The ray of hope is innovation, be it product innovation or process innovation. That is what is required for India to be innovating. India is innovating right now. Now, to look at uh, what are the streams which will flow to creating this process and product innovation. Multiple streams, medicine, design, man management, allied health professions, all coming together to make sure that uh, product or process innovation is happening. Although the innovation is required, there is values of death. Um, a large health person today uh, or a health person faces a problem which is unmet clinical need and there is a solution, a concept in their mind and to make it a reality, the values of death uh, which, which has to be crossed. For a concept to proof of concept to prototype to product to finally reaching the market and actually touching the patient and creating value to the patient is a long journey. So uh, one, a single person or a healthcare professional or uh, engineer is not going to, uh, very difficult for them to cross the valleys alone. So what we need is a team, uh, bringing together a team where uh, uh, these engineering clinician side and engineers can together uh, make sure that the values are proposed. So how, what could be done is, uh, so we are betting uh, Biomedical Engineering Technology Innovation Center. We act like a running partner for MedTech innovators. The MedTech innovators can be uh, anyone who wants to make a change in the healthcare system in the country. Uh, be it allied healthcare professionals, healthcare uh, professionals, your engineers, anyone who wants to make a change. We call them medtech innovators. It could be small scale industries who are only in the distribution. They don't have an R&D and they want to uh, develop something in the country. We help them. Uh, if there is a, a young innovator and they want to uh, solve a problem which is a pressing need in the country and we help them uh, cross the valleys of death. So uh, we are supported by Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, DST, ICMR, Bayada Academy Foundation. Uh, with whatever we have done, they have seen the value uh, of center like this could bring in changing or transforming the healthcare system in the country. Uh, so we have been fortunate that uh, there's support from the government agencies and foundations uh, in that sense. How we do is we have a very defined innovation process. We are ISO 13485 certified lab, one of the first uh, labs or centers in, the, in an academic center uh, to have ISO 13485. So it is very simple, four-step process, define, develop, deliver, deploy. It all starts with the clinician and us or giving or uh, figuring out there's an unmet clinical need which is there in the hospitals and how that can be uh, solved. So we form the team, uh, which includes multiple streams, as, as I said uh, before, a clinical immersion program to say so one doctor would be feeling there's an unmet clinical need. Validate with 100 other doctors is what is required to make sure it's not just one doctor is facing the problem, but multiple of such uh, doctors are facing, making sure that it's a, it's a significant need in the country. Then we get into the de development phase. We create a um, uh, prototype, deliver. There is pre-clinical st studies required, human trials, the device certification, and finally deploying uh, IP and others. We make sure that clinician who is the clinical champion uh, in our process also is part of the IP. So, uh, it's, it's because that, that's where it all started. If you look at that, we have already received around 400 plus unmet clinical needs, uh, which is huge uh, in the country. We are uh, we were able to uh, develop a 250 proof of concepts, 50 prototypes, and finally 25 products. So from 400 to 25 products is what we were able to do. Rest all eaten up by the demons in the valleys. We are a small facility in IIT Bombay, 2,500 square feet, uh, with which we we are trying to do what is possible. Uh, we have uh, electronics prototyping uh, center, we have plastic prototyping, metal 3D printing, uh, titanium alloy implant 3D printing machines. Uh, we have uh, other medical grade machining uh, devices also in place. We have other centers, um, similar centers in um, CO uh, College of Engineering Pune and VNIT Nagpur. Um, we have uh, Clinical validation, uh, for clinical validation, we have MGM, who's helping us with uh, gait analysis and other which is required for rehabilitation devices. So one bedic or one sender in uh, institute is not going to solve the problem. So we need such 
uh, innovation process built in uh, the ecosystems which we have. So we have partner institutes uh, to, with, to whom we have shared our innovation process and how this can be done so that they can train uh, multiple other uh, professionals and then we can together uh, you know, transform the healthcare system. So engagement pipeline uh, for any health professionals or anyone or any medtech innovator is that you start with the clinical problems. So there is a program called Metha, a medical device hackathon, where there's clinical problems which is floated by the clinician or any healthcare professional is validated with multiple doctors and other stakeholders, hospital management, other stakeholders which are there. And we understand it's a pressing need, significant need which needs to be solved and maybe develop a concept or possible concept at the end of Meta. If the team also feels that, okay, this is worth solving and we want to take it forward, we have something called Medic, which is Medical Device Innovation Camp. It's a five-day intensive program. Day and night, people working together at the end of it, we create a prototype which is, uh, which is serving the functional requirements of the, uh, the unmet clinical need. Now, after which the, the greater value of death, which was there of prototype to product, Betic helps in converting that prototype to a final product, making sure it adheres to all the regulations required for the uh, for medical devices, uh, industrial design, all of that is taken care. Of. Uh, so they join as uh, fellows, or we run, uh, we have multiple programs uh, through which they can convert this prototype to product. These products are then exhibited in Medex programs, which we run. Then they incubated in business incubators, and then they go on scale. So it all starts with bedside to bench to business to back to bedside. There's a few uh, photos on the training which has happened uh, for Metha. So anyone who's interested in health, who wants to create a change, a delta change uh, in, in the healthcare system, they can join the training program, understand what is the process and how you can do it. And this is Medic where you can see it has been held in multiple places. At the end of this, uh, we create, so doctors also spend 24 hours uh, with us, uh, you know, taking time, understanding the clinical need. This has to be solved, so they take time out from their daily routine and spend time with the teams and uh, make sure the prototype is delivered at the end of the fifth day. What we are able to do um, is 25 products. So um, these are a few um, products which we have um, done. Uh, head to toe, we are uh, you know uh, domain agnostic in that sense. So technology could be um, in, uh, anything. It could be a simple Bluetooth technology. It could be as uh, humongous as a virtual reality or a virtual care, which we are talking about. We can take small steps in making sure that the admin clinical need is required. Uh, so you can see on the left hand side there is smart stethoscope which we have developed. Every doctor here would have had a problem of of, of during their MBBS time. Uh, the senior doctor would be telling them, uh, can you hear the heart sound, lung sound, hear, can you hear the mama which is there. The young doctor would take the stethoscope, he will not, or he or she would not understand the mama. At the end they will say, ah no, I understood. But most of the times it's missed out. And after a long time they think, ah, this is what the doctor said that day. But this could be solved with a very simple technology which is already available for a long time now. Uh, a, it's a simple module which can go uh, in between your stethoscope which can amplify the uh, sound which is heard uh, 16x times, noise filter, whatever is the surrounding noise, and uh, the doctor can hear. So he can actually uh, keep it on the patient and put it on loudspeaker and make everyone listen. This is what the murmur which I was talking about. Additionally, there is uh, data transmission through Bluetooth. So there is a specialized doctors, as, as we said, that's geographically and distributed. Now you have a specialized doctor in the city and uh, there are uh, junior doctors in uh, rural areas, uh, you know, uh, less uh, sophisticated uh, hospitals. They can actually place the stethoscope on the patient and the specialist doctor on the, uh, or the his or her senior doctor can say this is a uh, problem which needs to be, uh, 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 this is a, a murmur which needs to be taken care of. So that is uh, a simple technology which is taken uh, taken an unmet clinical need. Uh, then we have above knee processes, we have processes, uh, a lot of processes in the country now. Uh, the problem is the pro amputees uh, already have difficulty walking and we are asking them to come from rural areas to urban area to get a process is done. It's already a difficult situation and you're asking them to come stay for a day or two and then get the process done. 
what we have done is any healthcare professional or anyone a tailor in the rural area can take 16 measurements and the data which that can be transferred uh, to our sender and the 16 data is extrapolated and a CAD model of their stump is formed and we develop a design of processes for that person that is get that is 3D printed uh, process is formed and they can only come for the fitment test. So that is where a small technology of data or information traveling from one place to another can make a change. Now, looking at uh, patient specific implants, uh, you know, um, cancer, uh, uh, cancer is a major uh, problem in the country and we have uh, mandibular resection, uh, people who undergo mandibular resection. Now, uh, what doctors, have, there are standard implants which are available and doctors uh, try their best to make sure that they bend and uh, twist the, uh, the standard implants to adhere to the patient's anatomy. Uh, now that means on the, on the uh, OT table, they are spending time while the surgery is going on, trying to adjust the standard implant and uh, uh, trying to uh, conform to the anatomy. This is solved by um, uh, the CT, the doctor sends a CT scan to us, say that this is how I'm going to operate, this is how I'm going to resect, this piece has to be replaced. So we look at it uh, for the patient's uh, aesthetic as in making sure that the face is symmetric, uh, we understand the anatomy of the other side, we design the implant uh, which is patient specific uh, for, for the opposite side, we 3D print uh, using metal alloy, we post process it and it is delivered back to the doctor and it is uh, being implanted uh, to the patient. So it's how uh, multiple technologies like uh, latest technology like 3D printing, data transferring, digital imaging all can come together to create an impact. Club foot monitoring uh, is, club foot is a condition where your um, a child's um, foot are internally rotated and this can be corrected with quantities method. Now, after the surgery is done, there's a problem that uh, it, it is not adhered to. The problem is the braces are not worn and it, it uh, conforming to that is a problem. So it's a very simple sensor which can be put, making sure how many times the kid wore it and is the problem of kid wearing it or not wearing it. So when the doctor, so the data goes to the doctor and doctor understands that is a problem of uh, brace not being worn. So how sensor can come into play? Uh, in so sensor integration is one technology. Now, how each one of you can you know create a transformation in healthcare uh, in our country? Uh, Well-defined unmet clinical need is the first step in healthcare transformation product technology innovation, uh, which will include what, why, and for whom. As an example, you need a portable cabinet, which is what to safely store medicines. Why and in rural. Hospitals who. So I would request, I'll urge each, every one of you, healthcare professionals and allied healthcare professionals to look at your daily activities which are which you're doing as a task and write down in a paper or anywhere that this is step one, two, three, four. And is that is that a pain point step or it's a it's a valuable step which you're adding? So write it down and this delta changes or improving this delta uh, uh, improvements in your daily activities is what at the end will transform our healthcare industry. For more information, you can visit our website www.bt.org. Instantly, there is a site, uh, there is a page where if there is an unmet clinical need and you think that's a pressing need and needs to be solved, you can always submit uh, that unmet clinical need and then we can see how that can transform healthcare uh, in the country. Thank you all for it. Thank you, sir. That was very informative. Our next speaker is Dr. Ambuj Chaturbedi, Senior Vice President, ICICI Knowledge Park, Hyderabad, a clinician by training. Dr. Chaturvedi is a surgeon with experience across multiple specialties and diverse healthcare delivery settings, with roles across commercial functions at Johnson & Johnson Medical India, followed by leadership roles at Medtronic India. Sir has transitioned into a senior leadership role at IKP, heading healthcare initiatives. At IKP, Sir leads multiple verticals, including an accelerator fund, D Health Elite Enterprise Program, DEEP, that mentors and provides bridge funding for startups operating in the digital healthcare space. 
May I now request, sir, to please address the audience. Thank you. And uh, how much time do I have? Fifteen. Boy, I, I, I didn't know I, write, I wrote so much. She had a tough time actually going through the entire conversation. So, uh, is this... Uh, okay, this is on. So, good afternoon everyone. My name is Dr. Ambud Chaturvedi. And uh, for the next... Uh, I'll try to keep this short because I understand that uh, we already shortened time. I'll try to finish this in 12 to 15 minutes. The deal is, I need to see excited faces. <laughs> as long as I get that, I'm probably probably going to keep my promise. Uh, so while uh, while Arun talked about uh, Arun talked about what is needed, uh, uh, what are the kind of opportunities that are present within the med tech space, within the digital healthcare space uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, would be entrepreneurs uh, in terms of devices. I'll be talking more on the digital healthcare space. Uh, Arun comes in from the IIT Bombay universe, I come from the IKP universe. Uh, we do collaborate a lot across multiple programs. Uh, but I'll be talking a little bit about the future, I'll be talking about some fancy stuff. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is because I want to give you a flavor of while you solve the problems of today, there's a, there's a host of opportunities that are going to be there for you tomorrow. And I hope that at least some of you get enthused by what I'm going to talk about over the next 10 to 12 minutes. And uh, maybe some of you, when we meet later, would be working on one of those solutions. Um, so the flow of thoughts is going to be, I'm going to talk about uh, a short history of medical technologies. I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick on that one. Uh, not that the history is short, it's just that I am, I am short on time. Uh, I'll give you a big picture view, uh, the present, uh, again a very short overview. Then I'm going to get into the present with some case studies. These are case studies of uh, startups which have been spawned uh, at IKP. IKP is the largest healthcare accelerator in the country today. We have close to about 800 startups physically or virtually incubated. I'm going to talk about just four of them. Um, then we're going to get into the future. We're going to get into some major disruptions in the future. Uh, and then it's open for discussions if you still feel that you have uh, the patients left. Um, that's a short history of digital healthcare. Uh, in a sense, the summary of this slide is that you know it all started in 1897. Uh, that was the first telecall that uh, was delivered. And guess what? A patient of viral group, cuff as you call it, an infant patient of three years, was actually diagnosed purely on a phone call, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, and then the doctor interacted with the mother and the patient. So the point is that uh, the entire concept of medical technology is digital health has been there for quite some time. It's only in the last couple of decades that uh, the, the pace has uh, uh, caught up. 56, so it took almost 60 years for the next set of critical technologies and devices to come into place. Clinical USC was one, and even there, uh, the first applications were military in nature, and only after the military applications of using sonar, uh, actually by, by, by you know, to do spot submarines and torpedoes, torpedoes, that's when it was brought into medical technology. But after that, when you see, you, you start looking at uh, 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 innovations in molecular biology, DNA, DNA sequencing, the entire works, you start to see that there's a tremendous, uh, that the pace caught up. Now you see the next phase where you see a lot of associations being formed and that typically happens. Initially science, uh, in medical science typically borrows technologies from other disciplines. Then there's a host of associations that come in, momentum builds, and then finally you start looking at all the, all the aspects around technologies being developed, digital therapeutics, wearables, FDA kind of providing uh, validation to it, and then COVID happened. The reason why COVID, the f of 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 the lot of negative things that COVID has, one of the positive things that uh, quote unquote can we can talk about COVID is that it did accelerate digital technologies, and so that's the reason why we why put out there COVID as one of the key milestones in the development of digital healthcare. Um, now. <sighs> There are multiple ways to predict. There are multiple ways to predict the future. You, you do it on, on how the past has behaved. And a lot of that is based on you know what I feel. But what we've done now at IKP is we've kind of built a model. Uh, we call it, uh, for the want of lack of creativity, we call it the three themes, three impact, three eras model. What it means is that when you look at when you look at healthcare, if you want to look at technologies all across and you want to map out how how, how are these technologies going to go forward? There are three key themes 
on which the technology impacts. It could either be diagnosis, it could be treatment, it could be monitoring. Now, technology has an impact. There are three types of impacts that technology has. When technology enters any of these themes, it first complements the existing practitioner. Then technology starts to compete with the practitioner. And then technology ultimately compensates. It means it almost replaces the practitioner, which is where you actually say this is fully automated. And so therefore, if you look at this, you have a three by three matrix. And when you look at, a, a, at those nine boxes, you, what you get is actually the nine errors. Now, if you start mapping over the last 100 years or so on how technology has been evolving, you'll find that uh, technology first started complementing diagnosis, that's error one. Then it went towards competing within the existing framework with practitioners, that's error two. Then technology started complementing treatment, error three. Then it went to complementing monitoring, which is error four. Then started compensating diagnosis, which is error five. And finally, it went into, so at the current era, we are at the technology is, the technology in the medtech industry is actually competing in monitoring. Now, if you start looking at specific examples here, um, that's where we are talking of error one, which is that you're looking at technology complementing diagnosis, imaging tech. X-rays came when Ronshan came in the picture and you found that X-rays were able to complement diagnosis. Uh, X-rays were able to show physician a picture into the, uh, in, into the patient's uh, anatomy uh, more. And so it complemented diagnosis. Gradually, you had biochemicals and biomedicals coming in and you found, you found that technology can now compete. So you have a physician who has the ability to do clinical examination and then you have the biochemicals coming in and they are giving you a different picture altogether. Not a different picture, I would say, but, but a very strongly competitive picture. You can diagnose a lot more when, when these come in across. And so therefore technology started competing. That's when biochemicals and biomedicals came in. The third piece was where technology started complementing the treatment part. So you could suture, now you could step in. You could ablate, but you could you could you could ligate, now you could ablate. And so therefore you have endomechanicals energy based devices coming in. And uh, that was the third phase. This was about the 40s. The, this was World War II, yeah, around World War II. So the 40s to 60s was this phase. Uh, then you started having technology which was complementing monitoring, which is the remote monitoring devices. This is when roughly about uh, 80s to 90s. And then the last two, which is technology compensating AI based diagnostics. We are now reaching a stage where certain AI platforms are so strong, so robust that they can actually obviate the need to a large extent for, for, for the presence of a clinician. You, 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 you still require a pilot uh, uh, to drive the aircraft, but essentially a lot of the part, a uh, lot of the automation has now been taken over by technology. And then of course you have digital therapeutics which comes in where it competes with monitoring. Digital therapeutics is your technology's way of saying, hey look, uh, if you prescribed uh, a treatment, and you want adherence, I will ensure that this happens. And so therefore, this is the stage where we are right now. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where the entire past of digital healthcare, this is where we are today, where AI-based diagnostics and digital health therapeutics. Now, this is the present, I won't go into details of this, a big digital healthcare market, lots of startups all across, we deal a lot with them. Um, this is the program that we talked about, you know, digital health uh, elite enterprise program. It was a program started by IKP to support specifically digital healthcare startups. These are startups which are commercial ready. Uh, they need bridge funding for scale up. We typically provide them about $100,000 to $150,000 over a period of 12 to 18 months for a small equity. Uh, usually the instruments are convertibles in nature and we look at evaluation multiple, they can exit after 12 to 18 months depending on pre-series A or uh, series A. Now, uh, this is the first cohort of uh, DEEP that we have. We've got a startup in the ARVR domain one in the telehealth domain, one in mHealth digital therapeutics, and one in the remote monitoring devices. A quick one out here would be, um, this one works on uh, the fMRI images of the brain. It tends to give an objective, it, it tends to convert the subjective diagnosis by a mental health professional into objective parameters. Uh, NFR, MRI has been used extensively for this. This team is doing great work. In fact, this team is now working with uh, the assault systems to work on uh, the FDA program for the work for building a virtual brain. So, you know, in the morning there was a discussion around 
uh, simulation or one of the key areas where uh, technology will start to play a role and this is one of them is where you reduce not completely open, but reduce the need for clinical trials by actually having uh, simulation platforms a virtual brain and you test all your drugs here um, the next one is um, a specialty care telehealth service it's called UV care they again you know they're looking at palliative care in fact we had a call last week they will now move into onco care converting the current hospital based care delivery into a group practice based delivery so that's again another disruption that this portfolio startup will come in this one's easy set up by a husband wife couple what they've done is they've they've uh, they built a monitoring solution that you can put onto your joints and the way it works is it then calculates the ROM, uh, the, the, the range of movement of the joints uh, which helps a physiotherapist but it also adds the EMG component and so what it does is it combines these two parameters, correlates them and then gives you a better idea about how your patient is complying with your physiotherapy regimes and whether your patient is improving or not. And then this is South Health, they are into digital therapeutics, they are more into, uh, it's an AI platform. In, in a nutshell, this platform increases the engagement between a patient and a doctor. And uh, the way it works is they've got multiple specialties all across. These guys have actually published an entire set of uh, papers for Harvard, uh, uh, you know, for the Harvard journals where they're talking about digital phenotypes. And so this is the kind of work that has been done by deep portfolio startups in now. Now we go to the future. Okay, I'm still, I'm still on time. Uh, so we go back to the three themes, three impacts, nine errors model. Uh, and we look at those matrix. We talk about imaging tech, uh, biochemicals, endomechanicals, remote monitoring, AI, and digital. What's next? You see three gaps. The next one is going to be surgical robotics. And so over the next over the next decade or so, you will see a big chunk of work in the advanced medtech field being done in the area of surgical robotics. This is where technology will start to compete uh, with a practitioner. Uh, where are we right now? We've started building modular, modular arms. We have a couple of uh, solutions in the market. Uh, intuitive Medical obviously is one of the oldest, but then there are other uh, solutions that work in different domains. So orthopedics industry is one which has been heavily influenced. Um, and there are a couple others uh, that also, urology is one. Uh, but you will see some really uh, jazzy stuff coming up over the next decade. Uh, Metronic is going to come up with, you. they've already launched in a couple of countries, they should be launching more. And then you'll see a host of other solutions coupled with surgical robotics coming in. And so therefore for would-be would be entrepreneurs or would be innovators who, who want to look at what's next, well, this is next. So surgical robotics, an entire array of array of innovations around surgical robotics would be an area where uh, some of you would be interested. Um, the next one would be the health concierge concept where technology starts to compensate. It takes, it takes the practitioner out of the equation. I'm not saying out, that's a little harsh word, uh, but it, it does obviate the need for large scale for, for, for too deep a communication because now it's your say, say so so you so you are at your home and your Alexa basically talks to you uh, talks to you about uh, and there are sensors all across at your home it's a smart home so the Alexa knows that probably you're anxious or you're depressed Alexa talks to you counsels you that's where the next step or you probably stressed out your 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 salt content, your electrolyte content in your sweat uh, detects and, and tells you that you are dehydrated. Alexa suggests you to hydrate yourself and get a glass of water. Or you've forgotten your drugs and Alexa tells you, well, you need to take your drugs on time. So there are multiple ways in which there's a lot of technology being built around this. The overall umbrella technology is called health concierge. And so Alexa is just one example. There are other, other solutions which are getting into it. But then the final one where technology starts to compensate for the basically technology takes the practitioner out of the treatment is something which right now is only the stuff of sci-fi movies, but I would encourage you to you know, go back. I, I didn't put a video here because it was, it was too heavy a fight, uh, but I would encourage you to you know, watch this movie, Prometheus. Uh, I, can, I can get in murmurs if some people have actually watched it. There's a scene where you know the female protagonist the typical uh, Western sci-fi movies, there's an alien parasite inside her tummy. And now what she does is, 
she gets into a cylindrical tube and she programs the cylindrical tube to do a delivery. And the entire procedure, the entire anesthesia, uh, the, the, the sterilization, anesthesia, incision, bleed control, depression, uh, and parasite removal and subsequent closure is all done in the cylindrical tube by a group of modular arms. So when a lot of people tell me, Doc, we don't need surgical robots, we need, I, I said we need both. There's, a, there's this big debate, you know, we don't need bullet trains, we need both. We need space research, we also need primary health care, we need, uh, so you need to solve both those problems. That's how technology starts to converge and at some point of time, you will see the Prometheus model pretty much active. Which brings us to the final question, if all of this is going to be done by technology, what happens to my my fraternity, which is doctors. And so there's some interesting observations out here. Uh, I, I've had interesting conversations with all my colleagues across the area. They say, Ambuj, this is not acceptable. I said, it's not a question of not acceptable. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. It's happening right now. And so if it is happening, how do you actually look at the, the entire set of disruptions? And you look at how this has been mapped out. So you'll see on this diagram, you know, right, if, if, so there's a sick child, there's a patient. You have a parent at home, a nurse, family doctor, and a specialist. When you start moving from the parent to the specialist, the clarity of rules is very simple. Parents, in, in terms of parents, they know, but this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm not going to do. It's very simple out there. The clarity of rules at the specialist is very deep, is very ambiguous. And that's because the skill required is pretty high, it's pretty deep out there. It's The skill required at the parent level is little. And so the entire concept of the future of how a doctor will, what role a doctor will have in the ecosystem will be, there will be task shifting. And so gradually as you start looking at simplifying the rules, you will start looking at lesser or less deep skills to be required to perform those. Now what I mean by that is, at some point of time, and this is an interesting book, if you haven't gone through it, it's a wonderful, so the author's name is Christensen Clayton. He, he written, he's written a couple of books on disruptive innovations and he focuses on healthcare a lot. I read this post uh, pre my MBA, and this was around my MBA time, 2008, 2009. Wonderful, it changed the way I looked at healthcare. But till then, I was a very individual patient clinician focused guy. But then when I looked at this, so what he says is, your primary care physician's practice you know, there are three components that will happen. There's a concept of rules-based precision medicine, which is that, you know, if you, if, if you have tuberculosis, rifampicin, asoni acid, paracinamide, thambutol, the entire range of drugs that you have, you, this is what you need to give. These are, the, these are the protocols, these are the lab tests, this is how you need to. That's rules-based precision medicine. Uh, or, you know, if, if you have COVID-19, so we had a cocktail of drugs that we used to give. All of that will start to converge from primary care physicians, nursing practitioners at some point of time will start to gain. And so there's this, there's this uh, intermediary entity. Oh, time over. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I actually wanted one of this, you know, this is like, I wanted, I was wondering what was, what was written on it now that we all know. <laughs> I actually extended purposely so that I could read. <laughs> So, no, but I'll, I'll finish it up in 10 seconds. So, and so therefore, they will hand off. So, so there's a concept of physician assistant. And so that concept, so there was a question in the morning about, you know, what is the incentive for nurses to, and I would say that they need a career path as well. You know, the incentive doesn't only really lie in monetary, it also lies in a career path. And I think physician assistance is a wonderful career path. It's already been done in the Western nations. India is at a point where we could do that as well. The second part is chronic disease management, which is, you know, there's hypertension, there's diabetes, you have monitoring systems, you know how to titrate the drugs and you simply do that. That part will also go into the nurses network. What will remain with physicians will be the wellness examinations and the counseling piece, the practice of intuitive medicine. So, and this is interesting, doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patients in the care of the human frame in a proper diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. Says who? Thomas Edison. Says when? A century back. I checked it. This is not fake news. I, 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 because I couldn't believe this. Someone was such a visionary that he wrote this 100 plus years back. But this is exactly where we are going. And so there is a lot of opportunity for doctors in terms of getting into the intuitive part of medicine. There's a lot of opportunity for allied health professionals to start picking up all those tasks, taking advantage of task shifting and leveraging technology accordingly. With this, uh, I thank you all.
Thank you, sir, for your wise and wonderful session. We now open the floor for a discussion. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Gaurav. I'm a civilized son. Uh, sir, my question to you is like, okay, uh, we have seen progression of AIA deep learning, let's say, from the past decade, that is 2010 to 2020. So, if we look at a case of like IBM Watson, now I have been following that since 2011. It promised a lot. It's said to replace all the ideology, it could replace everything. But right now, if you look at the status of 2022, they wanted IBM was already opened it up. The headquarters is already divided to IBM is divided to set up. The main problem that is cited, or other studies have cited that artificial intelligence is not yet, we can call it as a general intelligence at the level of the human intelligence, and it cannot provide the insight into the treatment. So, for example, if there's a patch in the lung and x ray shows a patch, or on CT also shows a patch. Now, there are n number of diagnoses which cannot be correlated with the other, say, uh, other pathologies that are present in the body. Because AI models, as far as, I mean, we can't interchangeably use AI and machine learning, but let's say machine learning models, they work on either Bayesian or a neural network, whichever you are going to train it. But it's always going to see a particular pattern and then draw from it. It cannot inference other. Uh, Patient factor and then come to a different diagnosis. So, like, how do we progress with these things, sir? We already are. So, the way this works is key. You also have to understand that AI, ML, which is what you want to look at. Uh, it's a relatively new science. We're still grappling with a lot of that. You can also say that it is nothing but just your own science. You, you, you will see that as well. Um, we work on the NDH and the National Digital Health Mission. We get the link and sex. Our current uh, aim is only to look at AI, only at a population of the to so say, you know, if you get insights and this is the typical sex. What you are talking about is AI essentially starting to take the role of a human face. I'll tell you where the, where the issue is. This, I'm, I'm just giving you insight, sharing insights which I've had with other experts that have talked to this approach. When a doctor, when a clinician is diagnosing a patient, there are a lot of conscious signals that he or she gives. There are a lot of subconscious signals that are working. And now what happens is, when you start building an AI platform, so to say, an algorithm, so to say, the conscious ones are those which are excessive. Right? I can be a wonderful doctor. I can treat patients. I have a magic wand. But for me to be able to know how I did that, there is a conscious bucket and a subconscious bucket of intelligence that are used. Conscious is a fact. Subconscious isn't. And so therefore, a lot of what the, the, the algorithm will ultimately dish out will depend on who, which doctor have they talked to, who has been used to clinical equipment, who is a clinical advisor for that program or the clinical advisors for that program. And so therefore, the data, the, the current stage is infancy at best. It's maybe uh, maybe five or six years, three years, maybe, but, but not more than that. And the reason is you require richness of data. At the same time, the practitioner has to be able to annotate to a point where a uh, regular candidate is known. And so they put, I mean, I also have a homegrown company in which we, we look at the uh, uh, AI and we annotate stuff Google, Microsoft, and stuff like that. And there, we have a very strict selection criteria of organizations. I'm not saying that a clinician who cannot annotate is not a good clinician. Being a good clinician and being able to understand why I'm a good clinician are two different things. And so therefore, a lot of times clinicians have this intuitive sense. But if you ask them, they can't. And so therefore, that is the gap today. Of course, we have also as other technologists that they're not able to elicit the right answers. This gap will be filled over a period of time. The other part is a conflict should be. So when you said you know lung a heat type, but then there are you know there are say 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 for some meds and it takes out in the bones in the spine and the liver, if you do not if you don't go that road, that's context setting. Context setting will also get us. So given some time, um, let's not uh, completely discard uh, uh, you know the, the, the potential. Uh, I can see that we are moving there. Uh, 
uh, much as I as a doctor would want to say, no, I should so be. Uh, I can see that there will be a balanced uh, way of healthcare delivery in the future. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Dr. Sakit. So, I, as I said, I attend the biomedical department for Maharashtra Games. So, my question is very basic, just to get the point of view from both of you dignitaries is that what is the lifespan of any instrument, biomedical instrument, defined, or where can I find guidelines from the Indian version? Because I have worked for you overseas as well. So, there are defined protocols that a machine, whether working uh, in best of its condition. It needs to be discarded in two or three years and be replaced. So my question remains very basic that what are the guidelines in Indian scenario as you both are uh, coming from the background with a huge experience and if there are, where can I find you for? Because in India the experience so far in last 20 years I'm working so unless the machine dies completely, because I'm using a product, I'll not name it. it. It's eight years we are using it. Now the company has stopped manufacturing. I'm not getting spare parts. But uh, no one is ready to tell me that uh, what is its lifespan. So just the background of my question. Thank you. Sir. So we do not have a medical regulation for some of this. It was under so at least we have medical device regulations now. We have uh, government trying their best to make sure that uh, the devices are you know are regulated as much as possible. And uh, a part of that regulations are not regulated, then I suppose we go that there's a procedure which needs to work. Coming to the medical device, if you're an ADH accredited hospital, there is standard uh, calibration which you need to do for your devices which is there. Uh, if it is, uh, if it don't, I would urge that it don't depend upon government. As a person, you want uh, the best in the human condition, take care of the medical equipment. Uh, it's a critical issue. If you the lifespan of a medical device, take the critical component, the figure of that critical component is a lifespan. So you can use as much as you want till there is a regulation case. But I would urge the hospitals take that, uh, that consideration that okay, this is not good for the patient, at least that is the case, uh, and discard the uh, device after that. Sir, I'll modify my question. I, I will ask the 25 products you launched in the market, right? So have you mentioned any specific lifespan or any guidelines that it should be replaced after so many cycles? Like a projector has emission cycles for the body, right? So that way. So if you could so answer. So the user manual service now, what has to be replaced when? What component has to be serviced uh, at what period? So there is a document which needs to be submitted to the regulatory uh, body that this is what has to be. There's a documentation of the dossier file has been created in some similar series. And this is the component. So they go to the meticulously go through the uh, one document and make sure that it is there. Yeah, that's the answer. So they Component and every every product actually has its own user manual, which is actually what you said. Having said that, you know, that is what we call in terms of regulation, but we all know we are a country where you first use a shirt as a shirt, then you use it as a bag, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so there's a cultural issue here. <laughs> Since there's a time constraint, I would like to now invite Dr. Samita Jadhav, Deputy Director, Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences, to felicitate our speakers. With this, we would close today's pre-conference symposium. Now, we request you to move to the courtyard of Symbiosis Medical College for Women for lunch. The post-lunch session will start by 2.15 p.m. and we request you all to be gathered back by 2.10 p.m. And please visit our FOSH stalls. Thank you. <laughs>